Well, it's 546, so we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Can you all hear me? Audio is coming through for everyone. Okay, great. All right, well, tonight we are honored to have um, Reverend Nat, Nat Young. He is the owner and cider master mm -hmm. of Reverend Nat's Hard Cider. And uh, I think most of you have seen a movie with him in the movie as the star, as the rock star of the movie. So um, this is gonna be another great you know, opportunity to learn about different type of, of product. We've covered a lot of um, craft beer, but we always try and touch on spirits and cider. And we haven't had a mead talk yet, but um, Nat is one of the experts in our area on cider and has an amazing uh, amount of knowledge about the topic. So for those of you who are cider fans, this will be great for you. And for those of you making other products, he'll also touch on the aspects of cider making that affect on beer or maybe making a distilled product from apple and fruit-based products. So I will be the slide driver. And again, I think I've mentioned to all of you that um, Occasionally, we will lose the camera because we're still having some issue with our technology, but we will not lose the audio, and I bring the camera on. Usually, it takes me like a minute or two to get the camera back. Uh, it's something to do with the, the Canvas interaction with the technology we use here. And who knows? Eventually, we'll solve it. But so far, so good. And let's have Nat take it away. So everybody think of your questions. Um, I didn't receive any questions in advance because we haven't been, a lot of people I think feel that they can get their questions answered in these live sessions and we've always had time for everybody's questions. So um, just so you know the camera's that up piece up there. All right, so Nat's gonna start and um, sure. tell a little bit about your, how long you've been in business. Sure, history. sure, thanks. Uh, so you've, you've all seen the, the video but there's um, uh, a couple of different things that we're going to cover today, uh, at least in the beginning, and that's primarily around, you know, what is cider? Rather than cider as a business, the question is what is cider um, and how do we make it and stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, in, in case you forgot some from, some from the previous uh, video, uh, we've been in business now for about two years, two and a half years. Uh, we have a, a few thousand square feet here in Portland where we make, we do all of our apple pressing, most of our most of our own pressing. Uh, we do all the bottling, all the actual fermentation, um, and then everything goes out uh, from our place as well. Um, we're the largest cidery in Portland, and one of, I think, the fifth largest in the Northwest at this point. Um, so we're, we're getting up there, and we've only been in business for um, two years, two short years. Um, so you wanna dive into our first slide there? Uh, this is just a sort of summary about what we're going to talk about, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. We can talk about anything beyond this, but I will start off just what is cider and briefly describe it versus beer and wine, um, how the cider made, what equipment is used, a lot involved in this stuff, uh, what's the history of cider, and briefly we'll touch on why I think uh, it's undergoing a bit of a revival and, and the market's growing so fast right now. Right. So uh, the biggest thing about cider is that it is wine making. We don't brew cider, we make it. You, you don't have a brewery or you're not a brewer, um, you're a cider maker, just like there's a wine maker and they work at a winery. We are cider makers and we work at a cidery. Uh, legally also, we have a winery license. We cannot have any grain at all in our cidery. Um, if the, uh, uh, state government or federal government were to come in and see like a bag of grain sitting in the corner, lose our license because it would be, uh, it's a prohibited ingredient, not only prohibited in the products, but it's prohibited in the entire facility. I don't exactly know why that is, but it's, it's amazing that we, we can't have any grain and yet a brewer can have all the apples and grapes in their facility that they want. Of course, a distillery can have absolutely everything and can make everything as well, but we can talk about that later. 
Um, there are a few other prohibited ingredients, but they're pretty much all just grain-based stuff. We're not allowed to put any corn or barley or uh, wheat or whatever into our products at all. So, uh, moving into the, the question of how is cider made. Um, we start, this is actually a picture of my daughter riding up the elevator. Uh, we have um, the bins of apples come in uh, 800, 900 pound bins. Um, they get dumped onto this elevator. It was just, we had some great footage of this in the video that, um, that you probably have all seen. Um, they go up the elevator and then on the next slide, they go into our, our grinder, which is here. Uh, the apples go in that top chute, and where those, uh, right in the in the middle where that circle is, there's a motor, and then to the left of that, there's uh, spinning blades, and those chop them up, chop up the apples, and the chopped up apples go into that hopper below there, that big square looking thing. On the bottom of the hopper, there's a pump, and then we shoot the apple pulp. At that point, it's like really coarse applesauce. We shoot it out of the hopper and into our juice press. Uh, you can go to the next one there from the press. Um, this press is a um, uh, hydraulic press. Obviously, the, that big red piston on the front um, squeezes the pulp. You, you shoot the pulp in between those plates there that you can see in the picture. Um, the, um, the, it, we have a, the pump you know, squirts the pulp in there, and then the piston expands or contracts to squeeze the pulp, the juice hits the tray uh, underneath, and then we pump it off into our fermenters. Those three pieces of equipment that you saw, the, the elevator and the grinder with the hopper attached and this uh, juice press, um, these are uh, big industrial sized pieces of equipment. They're pretty expensive and it's the same type of equipment, um, same manufacturer, um, same style, that the, some of the biggest um, apple juice processors in the country use. Um, we just have a slightly smaller version of it, but that is how the big guys make juice. Um, and we can make uh, the 13, about 2,000 gallons a day, somewhere around there, um, of, of juice with our press. Uh, and that's running two shifts. So we could make more if we ran 24-7. There is a big juice processor in uh, Hood River called Ryan's Juice. For those of you in the Northwest, you may have seen Ryan's Juice in the grocery store. It comes in a gallon jug. It's, you know, just fresh pressed apple juice. Um, they have the exact same press, just a slightly larger version of it. And they actually have four of them that they run 24 hours a day. So we, we definitely operate in the same scale as, as uh, the largest juice processors uh, out there. The, the, the curious thing about, I keep saying juice processor and not cider maker, because at this point, up to this point, all we're doing is making juice. We're not necessarily making, making cider, uh, making hard cider. Uh, unlike uh, brewers um, who have to have specialized equipment in order to make their, you know, their juice, which is their mash, um, we have, our specialized equipment is used by um, juice processors as well. So that also, because uh, we have the same equipment and the same process ultimately, um, that lets us buy juice from juice processors as well. So we, um, at this point, it's about half and half. We press about half of our own apples and the other half we buy already juiced. Um, variety of reasons why we buy juice versus press our own, our time, um, the schedule that we're, that we're dealing with at that moment, um, limited floor space in our cidery, um, limited truck uh, movement, uh, in and out of our place can be more difficult. Um, those are the big things, but it's great to be able to buy juice um, if it works out for our recipes and if it works out for our business to have that option. As a brewer, you can't find somebody to sell you wort. That you could, that doesn't really happen. So we're pretty thankful in that regard. So ballpark figure what this investment in, in equipment might mm. be? This piece that you're looking at right now uh, is a $35,000 price. It's made in America. Uh, there's the, the previous grinder and pump was also about 25,000 and the elevator is 10,000. So we're in, um, we have this a couple other pieces of equipment that manage it, but the total operation of, of making juice is about a hundred thousand um, dollars, which is, you know, it's still in the same ballpark as a brewery really. So 
um, there's certainly ways to uh, compare those costs favorably. The big difference, though, is that you can make cider without um, having any of this equipment. That may be a great thing to think about. Uh, as well as, you know, because I said that cider making is winemaking, wineries, there are some wineries that just buy juice uh, or they buy fruit, um, press their own. They don't grow their own grapes. Um, uh, you can make really good wines by buying uh, grape juice, or the right kind of grape juice, of course. So, um, you know, and you take, take that another step and say, which, what breweries grow their own grain? You know, just because we don't grow our own apples doesn't mean that we can't make great cider. So I think we, we try to have a, a bit of a hybrid approach to uh, really caring about the fruit and contracting with growers on, on the one end. On the other end, we just, we buy um, uh, commodity juice as well, depending on the product that we're making. Just one other question before we move on. The 2,000 gallons that you get in that one day, that's one truckload of, one semi-truckload of apples? Yeah, well, a full truckload um, holds 48,000 pounds, and it produces about 3,600 gallons or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, we have a tank. We have one large fermenter that's sized to be the size of a truck. So the truck shows up with apples, and we turn that in, we press that all, and it all goes into one single tank. Um, and we size that tank specifically for that truckload mm -hmm. of, of apples. We have other tanks that, we're, that, we've, that are being made for us right now that are sized for a tanker of juice. And a tanker of juice is um, between 5,500 and 6,000 gallons. So we want to have different sized tanks that are available for different applications that we have. Some wineries use floating lid, uh, variable capacity tanks, so the lid can go down or it can go up. I think everyone who uses those hate them. Um, they're really hard to clean, and they're not as great as you think they are. Um, but we don't ever mess around with, we've now, I've never used a floating lid tank, a variable, variable capacity tank, and I have no desire to, mm -hmm. to do that, based on the feedback I've heard from people who own them. Yeah, sure. So uh, this is an example, another another picture of the press. Uh, you can see after the, there's these bags that are, it's like an accordion, right? So there's pulp in those bags. And after the juice is pressed, you push a button and the thing tips up and um, all the spent pulp and the dried pulp falls out of the bag um, over the back side of the press. And um, we actually had a pig farmer come today and pick up some juice, some, some pulp that we uh, had from, um, late last week. So it all goes into cattle feed and um, pig feed mm -hmm. as well. And when it comes out, it's really dry. It's a bit like a doormat. It's just, it's flat. It's got a little waffle pattern to it because of the way the press is. And it's, um, it's very dry and, and doesn't really mold very fast. So we're able to take a few days to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. well, the pigs will eat moldy. They love it. <laughs> they, I think they probably prefer it. <laughs> it's a little fermented. Uh, yeah, so there it is, um, that stuff sitting outside of our place. Um, these are the, actually the bins that the apples come in. The pulp goes right back into them, so it's pretty easy for us to manage. Usually we put plastic underneath there because if it sits for a long time, it starts to weep and decompose a bit and makes a mess. But uh, we also have a bunch of plastic bins that we use that look just like this, but they're solid plastic, like big Rubbermaid bins, mm -hmm. huge Rubbermaid bins that we use as well. But you can see how there's these sheets, um, mats of the, of the pulp when they come out of the press. It looks just like that. So after it comes out of our press, we pump it up into, um, into our fermentation containers. Uh, here's um, a few shelves of these 275-gallon totes, or IBCs, they're called. Um, we have close to 50 of them at any one time with juice in them. We ferment in these. We also age in these, and we freeze juice in them as well. So one tactic that we do is we will press a whole lot of one variety of fruit. If it's only available once a year in the fall, we, we press all we can. If the apples don't store very well, we'll press it. Uh, put the juice in these totes and put them to a commercial freezer in town. Um, anybody, any commercial freezer can take juice, but you know, in very few places can take alcohol because it's a, you know, it's a controlled substance. You know, taxes and bonding for the facility. 
Um, and then as we need the juice, we'll pull it out of uh, the freezer and thaw it and uh, ferment it. And we don't notice any change at all in the uh, finished product and very, very little change in the fresh juice um, when the juice has been frozen. You can only fill them about three quarters full because they expand, of course, and you can really get the freezer warehouse people really angry at you if you fill them too full. Um, it works out really well for us to be able to do that so that we don't have a huge amount of capacity that we have to have on hand. We don't have, a lot of wineries have all of their product made, fermented, sitting in bottles all year long. Um, and we, not, we don't try to have any inventory on hand really. We bottle it and sell it right away. And having able to freeze those containers is, is a really great way for us to um, spread out our production throughout the course of the year. So we also have a lot of steel tanks. The tank on the left is the one that I mentioned that's um, sized for one tanker, sorry, one truckload of apples. Um, so that's about a 3,900 um, gross capacity. Um, we're not supposed to fill up more than that piece of blue tape on the very top of it, but frequently we do. Um, and then there's three deceptively large tanks in the back there on the right. The one in the back is a 60 barrel bright tank. So that's about 18, 1900 gallons. Um, the tall one directly underneath the flag is a 40 barrel bright tank. And that's, um, you know, 1400 gallons, 1300 gallons, something like that. And the little one in the front is um, sized for one of those totes. So sometimes we do special projects that are just one or two totes. So we have a bright tank that's sized just for those um, those batches. And the very, very front, is, that very shiny thing is a, a, a filter, a brand new filter that we just got today, a lenticular filter. Mm -hmm. um, it's a cross. No, not cross flow. Okay. So it's it, lenticular is just like a DE filter, oh, a DE. but it uses uh, pre-made modules rather than the actual DE mess that you mm -hmm. have on a leaf filter. Mm -hmm. um, the tank, the big tank on the on the left there is a single walled wine tank. It's a dish bottom, not a cone. So, and it holds no pressure. It's atmospheric pressure. Uh, it's a white wine tank. Um, yeah, and it's uh, just that height all the time. If we ever ever fill it halfway. We'll just put CO2 in the headspace, um, which uh, accomplishes the same thing as that floating floating variable lid that I mentioned before. Um, yeah, so then we all oftentimes will pump juice out of a tote that was frozen into the big tank, um, and sometimes we just ferment right in the plastic totes. Um, we've also sized our bright tanks according to some units of measurement for the big tank. So the big tank is 120 barrels. The two large bright tanks are 60 and 40 barrels. So that only leaves 20 barrels behind. So oftentimes we can ferment the whole big fermenter and then pull and then empty it in one run. We can put 60 barrels to one bright tank, 40 to another, 10 to the little guy, and we'll put 10 in a tote for processing later or whatever. So being able to have, uh, to not have like um, fractional leftovers um, can is really important for us to be able to continue to push things through is, um, and not have pieces left over, little bits and dregs here and there. It's, it's, it's very painful to throw away, you know, 200 gallons of, of juice, of cider, but oftentimes there's nothing good to do with it because 200 gallons, it's, it's very difficult to bottle 200 gallons in one run and it's too small for our bright tanks. Um, so we try to keep things in, in units like that as we're making it. Oh, did you see someone mention they liked your Cascadia? Cascadia, yeah. That, that Cascadia flag flew at uh, a Portland Timbers game, actually. So we had some Timbers fans bring us that flag. Um, there you go. Uh, we have, uh, so, so we also bottle ourselves there at the place, at our cidery. The bright tanks are, they're, um, they're just like beer bright tanks. So they have a glycol jacket on the outside to chill the product on the inside. Um, and then there's a carbonation stone, so CO2 bubbles in it and carbonates those tanks. They're pressure rated. They bottle right off of those. This is actually a picture from today, from like a few hours ago. We fill bottles um, basically by hand. Uh, we have a machine that's it's, uh, about four feet, six feet wide, 
it's a bit like um, a multi-head espresso maker. You stand in front of it and put a bottle in there, and flip some switches, and then go over to this one and turn it off and pull the bottle out. Um, so one person does the bottling, another person does the capping. And then the bottles go in these apple bins. Apple bins get used a lot at our place. Um, they get laid down in there, and then we pasteurize them. You can see the milk crates in the background. We um, don't have enough milk crates, nor would we want enough milk crates for all the bottles that we go through. Um, so it's labor intensive. We lay them down in these bins, and then as milk crates are freed up, we fill, in, fill up the milk crates with bottles, pasteurize them in a big bath pasteurizer, which is just like canning tomatoes, but you're um, bigger and more scientific. Uh, and then the hot bottles come out, and we uh, label them uh, by hand as well. We have like a machine that kind of just rolls the, the label on. Um, so we have about enough crates for one day's worth of work. If we had enough crates for everything, the, crate of, the milk crates would be a mile high, and that would be hard to keep a hold of. Uh, question there, how big is your facility? It looks pretty large. We have 3,500 square feet in this main part of the cidery. We have another 1,500 square feet in uh, a big back room that we access from around the side of the block. It's just a dry warehouse. We don't do any processing there. We store empty bottles and full bottles, uh, dry, dry goods storage there. Uh, how much cider do you expect to make this year? We grow every month. Um, our, our, our sales and our production grows uh, double digits every month since the beginning of the year. So I don't really know. Um, well, we're getting close to the end of the year. I should be able to come up with a number. Um, let's call it, um, let's call it 15,000 gallons. Sure. 20, maybe 20. Um, can your facility easily handle expansion? No. Um, we're kind of maxed out right now in space, but we, I think we're operating at about 30% of our production capacity. Um, that means we can run multiple, multiple shifts. We can run, I mean, I'm not opposed to running three shifts a day. Um, and there are a lot of efficiency improvements that we can do just moving cider through the process faster and out the door. Um, focusing on different products, uh, faster products to make rather than slower products to make. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways we can get more uh, throughput out of a small space. Uh, next question, did you say you ferment the plastic? Components? Yes, we do, and no airlock. Um, the, the plastic is HDPE, high-density polyethylene. It's the same stuff that um, your cutting boards are made out of. And the um, you can buy winery specifically winery made tanks. Um, they're thicker walled. These uh, IBCs are only a couple of millimeters thick, but we get to use sulfites because uh, we're winemaking. Sulfites are antimicrobial, but they're also an antioxidant. So those, those plastic walls breathe a little bit, but we keep up on the sulfites and uh, we don't notice degradation in the product at all. When we're actually fermenting in them, uh, we leave the lid um, closed down until the fermentation starts, and then we open it up, and the lid is so small, and the tank is, has so much volume that there's a tremendous amount of CO2 coming out, and it, it blasts the bugs away. It keeps the bugs from coming through a loosely fitted lid. Uh, then we monitor them, and then we lock the lid down when there's the last few points of gravity to go. We have experimented with airlock attachments. Um, you can get lid replacements that have uh, where you can put a hose onto them and put them in a bucket. Um, problem with that is we have 50 of these things, and sometimes we have 25 going all at once. And having you know 25 buckets and having dealing with these goofy hoses, um, it's just it's really annoying to to deal with. So we we rather we rather just pay a little bit more attention and manage the lids. Um, ultimately, though, our goal is to get rid of the plastic and only use steel. Um, well, 95% of the time, just to use steel tanks. Um, that big tank that you saw earlier holds 12 batches as opposed, so we can clean one twelfth the number of tanks, managing a twelfth the number of tanks, um, you know, uh, record keeping and inventory on one twelfth the number of tanks. So we're really into taking advantage of those sizes. We'll be moving away from the, the, the plastic in the future. Uh, next question, I've been making a setter for three years, but it seems to take an average of three to five months per five gallon batch. How can I get faster to another without affecting flavor? Uh, you can't. You will affect flavor. There's no way around that. Um, it is just like winemaking in that it's aging, and a lot of things happen in aging. 
the, what, what we've been able to do is find um, recipes that don't mm, require that extended aging or much aging at all. We can go uh, four weeks apple to bottle. Uh, the product tastes different, but I wouldn't say it tastes better. It affects the flavor if we were to let it sit for three to five months. Um, some products that we make take um, 11, 10 months to age. We, we need that flavor. Um, so, you know, from a business point of view, we want to get the product, um, get the fast products to be our best sellers. And just, just like that, they are. Our, our best products, our, our best sellers are our fastest products to make. Well, the best sellers are? Hoppercot, our hop, Hallelujah Hoppercot. Um, our ginger tonic is, pretty, is very fast to make. And that's primarily because they have other ingredients in them. Our Newtown Pippin takes, uh, we like to let it sit for at least three or four months before it gets into a bottle. Um, we have an English style revival that takes um, sometimes more than a year to come out. Our winter seasonal is always very long to make. Um, so we have some barrel aged stuff right now, yeah, as well. That that seems to just take forever. We don't we want to rush those things. So it's really a balance. That's the, that's the blend of uh, beer making and wine making that we do. Some of the stuff takes a long time to make, and some of it goes very fast. One thing I should mention: there's a tasting room in the back of that photo. Yeah, you can see there's a if you can see in the very back there's a white wall and uh, a piece of wood. Um, that's underneath that white wall. Uh, white wall is our office, and underneath that, in the dark, dark, shadowy area, is our ta our tap room. Mm -hmm. So you walk in the front door, and you're immediately in our tap room. And um, uh, so when you're sitting at the bar, you're looking at that earlier view that we had of the tanks. You're looking right at those tanks. You're looking at that Cascadia flag. Um, so we put the tap room right in the production space. I want people to see what we're doing, and we are constantly working when the tap room is open. There are only some things that we don't um, do when the tap room is open, like uh, make lots of huge noises and get the flow wet. Those are the only things that we try not to do when the tap room is open. Okay. So um, just to sort of recap a little bit here, we make the juice. Uh, sometimes we'll blend apples uh, prior to making the juice. Sometimes we blend apples afterwards. Sometimes we just uh, ferment single varietal. Sometimes we blend it ahead of time. Uh, we let the yeast do its fermentation anywhere from a few weeks to many months. We wait. Sometimes the fermentation takes two days, and sometimes it takes the actual fermentation takes two months. Um, sometimes we wait for a couple of weeks. Sometimes we wait for many months. Um, after that waiting period, there can be blending. We could take two different varieties we fermented separately and blend them together, depending on some kind of ratios that we're aiming for for flavors. Um, we could add flavors, you know, our hopricot is our best seller, that's hops and apricot. That gets, uh, those flavors tend to get added at the end after a long aging period. Um, we force carbonate in those big bright tanks. Some stuff we do bulk condition, but for the most part it's all force carbonated. That helps out turn things around faster. Uh, we bottle and we pasteurize, which I mentioned. Some things don't get pasteurized, um, but most stuff does. Uh, new question, do you, and I, I assume that means yeast. Um, yes, all of our, all of our big best-selling products, we um, pitch our own, we pitch commercial yeast, and we tend to just buy yeast every time. Sometimes we harvest yeast, I don't like it. Um, we're not, we don't make it every day, or every week, or whatever, so the yeast has to sit for a while, and that makes me nervous using old yeast. Um, and some products we do wild ferments on. Um, we have some, we have a number of batches going right now, they're all, that have never been, um, never had yeast pitched. Um, and some stuff that we make is both. We, our Newtown Pippin is wild fermented to start, and after a few points of gravity drop, that are thricks of drop, depending on how you're looking at it, we, um, we add uh, our own, we add a, a well start uh, yeast starter, so we can get some of the benefits of a wild fermentation flavor, but we, um, have I found the downsides. Uh, next question, how long is your average cider making day from apples to pitching? Um, I'll try to answer that question as I, as I think I see what you're saying. Um, day one is pressing apples. We got an error message here. Hold on a minute. Okay, uh, day one is pressing apples. 
sometimes that pressing happens for three or four or five days. Um, and then while the, if, if the, if it takes five days, we're pitching yeast on like the third day, let's say. Um, we don't put any sulfites in prior to uh, fermentation. Uh, if you read most cider making handbooks, they say add sulfites on as soon as it's juice. And we, we never do that. I don't see the point of it. Um, we instead, you know, the, the, the theory there is that you have, you're knocking down the existing cultures, bacteria in the juice and then adding, so when you add your own yeast in there, it has a, you know, a flat playing field. But we just over pitch. We make a huge, uh, we, we buy a yeast starter, then we start it for a few days until it gets to be really vigorously going, make it really happy, and then we put it in there. And it can just blast out anything that's happening, any other bad critters that are in there. Um, we also like to frequently let some of the juice ferment a little bit uh, by itself, and we're okay if the fermentation starts and then we add our own. Um, there are the earliest types of fermentation are what's known as apiculate yeasts, or in cider making it is anyway. Um, and apiculate yeasts can have some great flavors that you can't you can't buy a cult, uh, commercially produced apiculate yeast. The only way to do that is um, let it happen wild. So we're really not afraid of wild fermentations at all, and we really over pitch when it's time to pitch um, our own yeast. Yeah, apiculate is um, apic, A P I C, A P I C U, apiculate, L A T E, apiculate. Yeah, and that's a genus of um, uh, yeast. Uh, there's probably it's not commercially cultured, so you know it's a, it's a black hole in science right now. What's what's actually going on there? Um, you know, winemakers might probably know a lot about apiculate yeast. Be scared of them? I don't know. Um, so let's see. Uh, so then and then, but sometimes. Uh, so the question of average cider making day. Um, the other side of that question is how long do we work. We work for as long as it takes. Sometimes on pressing days we work for about 20 hours. Uh, we run two shifts. Um, um, and then you know, someone's back in there checking gravity, checking pH, and pitching yeast. We have to start the yeast ahead of time. Um, and then we, when, we, when we buy juice, the juice comes in on a tanker. It comes in at our target temperature. Um, so it goes right into the ferment and we pitch yeast right away. So sometimes, and those trucks are always there at 5 a.m. So by 9 a.m., we're carrying on with our day with another uh, 5,000 gallon in inventory, which is, which is really nice. Yeah. Any more questions? We're moving on. Um, yeah. Uh, so a little bit about the history of cider. There's uh, there's a a real curious um, sort of um, conversation that happens when you get a cider maker, a wine maker, a, a beer maker, and a, preferably a mead maker in, in the in a bar at the same time. We all start talking about which came first. Um, I am very convinced that mead was the first one. Um, it doesn't um, take much to make mead. You can have a honey bee thing fell over and rainwater, and then voila, mead. So uh, it's, it, can, it can be a natural process. Um, apples naturally ferment when they're, they fall off a tree. They can sort of rot on the ground a little bit. Grapes can do the same. But as sort of um, intentional product, I think it would be very easy for you know uh, early man, let's say, to um, to need with, without any idea about what they're doing, you just take yeast or t uh, take honey, mix it with some water, and let it sit. You can use a hot out tree trunk or whatever. But processing the liquid out of grapes and particularly out of hard apples is 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 more challenging. You have to uh, press them. You have to get rid of the pulp, um, or at least you have to strain it. And strainers, I mean, you know, what early man had strainers. Um, the uh, cider, everyone says, oh, cider's been made. You know, for a very long time, it has, but it, it only really has taken off with the event of the, of, the, of the screw in the Industrial Revolution. So, prior to the existence of the screw, it was very hard to get juice out of an apple. Um, you know, the whole thing about stomping on grapes that, that actually worked, but you can't stomp on apples. You could uh, grind them. You could um, early ways to make cider involve uh, a big stone uh, dish with a huge stone wheel uh, driven by a horse in a trough and the, the horse would drag this stone wheel around the trough and crush the apple. Okay, great, now you've got crushed apples. You still can't get the juice out of them. That requires a screw or a, we use hydraulic presses, but screws work fine. So 
you really see cider making taking off in the um, in the 1800s. Really, oddly enough, you can get uh, machine screws in the 1700s, handmade screws, um, and so we see some of that. But you know, prior to the re early, you know uh, late Renaissance, you don't really get any uh, cider making being you know, cider making happening, particularly because grapes were you know wine was big you know uh, then, so there wasn't a whole lot of reason to work extra hard for a lower alcohol product. Um, so uh, England um, had a lot of cider being made in the 1700s. There was, um, some of you probably already know that it was used as a uh, form of currency in, um, in England in the 17, uh, 16, 17, 1800s, even as late as the 1800s. Um, the, the farmer, uh, a wheat farmer, would um, hire uh, local, you know, transient laborer was to advertise that he had the best uh, hard cider. And uh, you know, the laborers would show up and they'd taste the product and say, okay, I'll work for you because this is what we're gonna get to drink. Um, there's a, a really silly advertisement that I think Weston's does right now, Weston's in England. They have that scene, you know, the farmer standing there with his hive and the, the uh, laborers coming up and then that farmer says, well, I just actually make cider rather than make growing grain. Um, so I don't know whether that's true or not, but there's there's a story about that happening, and we do know that it was used as a as a form of currency. Um, when those uh, Englishmen primarily came over to the United States um, in colonial times, they brought with them a love of cider, but they didn't have any of the same varieties. Um, those a lot of those varieties that grew in in England didn't grow well on the East Coast. Um, the Northwest Pacific Northwest, where we are, has very similar growing climate to England, but so if they landed here, they probably would have brought their varieties with them, but they didn't. They landed all up and down the East Coast. So those varieties didn't work um, in America. So the early colonial American um, cider was a very different product than they were drinking in England. Um, there are some recipes that they used to try to recreate some of the flavors. Uh, but for the most part, it, it, it did persist. They brought cider over here. We drank a different kind of cider, but we did drink it. Um, Prior to Prohibition, German immigrants started coming, and they brought with them actually a, a great knowledge about how to make beer. Uh, prior to that, the beer was really rough, uh, and they brought delicious beer with them. And beer fundamentally is cheaper to make than um, cider because uh, grain is cheaper than uh, uh, one unit of grain. To, to produce one unit of beer, the grain is cheaper than to produce the same size unit in with apples. Um, so we had great beer leading up to good quality beer leading up to prohibition. Prohibition happened. Everyone knows that the barrels were broken open in the street, but what they also don't say so much is all the were chopped down. There were huge orchards all along the East Coast and in the in the Midwest that were growing apples only for cider making. Those um, that you know that market disappeared overnight. So those farmers say, now what am I going to grow? Well, I'll peaches or I'll grow grain or corn or something. Um, in the East Coast, they shifted to other crops, fresh vegetables, and, and we lost all of the cider-specific varieties, and we lost all those apples. So when Prohibition was lifted, the Germans already like, hey, we can make beer in 21 days. And the cider maker said, I need five years, six years, eight years to grow a tree before I can get the apples. Um, so it never really bounced back. The in the last, you know, 15 years, particularly the last 10 years, um, the whole local lore movement and the renaissance of craft uh, products, not just beer and cider, but, you know, artisan bread. McDonald's has artisan bread. Everybody wants artisan something. Um, that has really helped out with understand, trying to figure out what they're drinking, what they're eating, and we, um, we, we are reaping the benefits of that now. I particularly think that cider is poised very well to um, compete or to play alongside craft beer. You know, we try to advertise to craft beer drinkers. We go to craft beer um, festivals. Um, we make products that have beerish ingredients or that actually use beer yeast. Um, so we, we love the craft beer revolution that's happening in America right now. And I think it's really important for cider making to grab onto that and become friends with all the brewers. Are there any more? I think it would be um, interesting to talk about the different types of um, apples that are available mm. to you now since the cut down on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, what has happened to the 
availability of apples in the West Coast. Right. So when um, when the Grand Coulee Dam went in in Washington, uh, dam in the Columbia, that really opened up eastern Washington's uh, croplands. Prior prior to that, it was a desert. It's still a desert, but it's a very well irrigated desert. Um, and the you know the best place for apples to grow is a well irrigated desert that gets a cold snap, a severe cold snap in the winter, and that is eastern Washington to a T. So there are more apples grown in eastern Washington and therefore in Washington than any other state, uh, than all of the states in the nation combined. Uh, Michigan and New York are second, third. Uh, there are sort of states that are distant fourths, uh, but it's all pretty distant after Washington. Um, additionally, it's like 60% of the, the crop that's grown in Washington goes out to export. Um, to uh, Asia primarily. So we have um, a huge amount of a volume of apples, but we only have five varieties. Uh, Granny Smith, Fuji, Gala, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, that's five. Um, there's, you know, you see, you go to grocery stores and you see this variety or that variety, but um, there are oceans of those five varieties grown um, in Eastern Washington and everything else is 1% of the market. Um, so with those five varieties, I'm faced with the prospect of how do I make good cider out of one of those, of those five varieties, if, if those are my options. Um, yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I use, uh, you know, one hundredth of one percent of one block of apples in eastern Washington. So I do use, I do use exotic apples, but the availability, year-round availability, and the price are what draw me to those five the, uh, the main line varieties. So um, our our two best sellers, our two or three best sellers, three top sellers, the Hoppercott and our Ginger, both use uh, Granny Smith, Golden Delicious, and uh, Pink Lady. Pink Lady is not one of the main lines, but it's like the sixth biggest one. Uh, we can sub out Pink Lady for um, uh, if we need to. Um, so we, I, I took it as a challenge. I said, how can I make a, a good, a, a well-selling product using uh, these copious volumes of apples that are available year-round, um, and we did. The third uh, of three bestseller, actually our second bestseller, is our Newtown Pippin. And Newtown Pippin is an heirloom apple, yes, but it is the most widely grown heirloom apple and only got bumped off the throne like about 50 years ago. It was Grant Smith before Grant Smith moved in. So there are still large um, tracts of Pippin being grown primarily for processing. Uh, it makes a great um, applesauce, and it also is an important ingredient in a lot of fresh juice, and it is one of the best apples for making caramel apples. Apparently, caramel apples are a big business in the Midwest. I don't, we don't get them around here except at fairs, but it's a big, the caramel apple business is big in the Midwest. So a lot of Newtown Pippin is still around, so that's one of the reasons why we chose that one as our heirloom apple. It really is legitimately an heirloom apple. It's been grown since the 1700s. Um, it was one of America's first agricultural exports prior to us being a country. Um, so it's got a long history. It's, it's an amazing, delicious, delicious apple as well. Other varieties that we like to use are um, cider-specific varieties. There's a lot of English and French varieties that we use that you cannot buy uh, at a grocery store. You cannot buy them at the farmer's market. They are grown only for cider making. Um, we have one variety of cider out right now that has 16 varieties of these English and French cider-specific apples in them. I won't bore you with the names. There's a lot of names there. Uh, question so, there. So let me preface this yes. that I actually d showed these guys your bottles on one of mm. our videos. The I had your flip top bottle, mm -hmm. Roche style, and then I I believe I showed you guys the cap bottle that you've moved to. So. Theo's now curious sure. about your experience. Yeah. You're not in the flip top anymore. Well, we still kind of are. Um, the big flip top bottle, the 750 milliliter to wine size bottle, it uses the flip top. It also takes a crown cap. So we still use that bottle. We crown cap it because uh, flip tops, because there's that rubber washer in there, mm -hmm. it, the rubber gets hot when we pasteurize the bottles and mm -hmm. we lose carbonation. Carbonation leaks out of that soft rubber. So we always crown cap and we hang the um, hang the swing top off the backside. So you can tear the crown cap off and then put the flip top back on for um, 
you know, for safekeeping in the fridge. I joke that people never do that because they just drink it. Um, no one is ever going to like save the bottle. Um, a lot of people love those flip top bottles. They use them for uh, water bottles. I've seen people um, just using them for water bottles and vases, and a lot of home brewers love them as well. Um, so we went from we went through a couple different suppliers. We had some Chinese flip top bottles that we used in the very beginning. They were actually better than the German bottles that we had, um, as far as leaking on the seals. It was a silicone washer from China, and that held its uh, it held up better in heat than the actual rubber Grolsch red rubber uh, washers that we use now. But we just hang them off the backside. The trouble is that bottle is you know the big bottle 750 with the swing top and the crown cap is about a dollar 37 a bottle just for the glass. And the five and the 500 milliliter bottle, which is two thirds of the size, um, with does not have a swing top on it. It's uh, from England, and that's a 34 cent bottle. So we can save ourselves over a dollar by a slightly smaller bottle. Mm -hmm. There's slightly increased flavor to fill more bottles, but it's more profitable for us to use that. Much more profitable for us to use that small bottle, and it's the same price per ounce. So it's 12 dollars on the shelf for a big bottle and eight dollars for the small bottle. So consumers only get and don't get gypped on the you know the, the contents. They just if they want the big bottle, they can get the big bottle in our limited releases and our seasonals are always in the bottles. Mm -hmm. Our year our three year round varieties are in the small bottles. Condition. Uh, only the, the year rounds are only in small bottles. Yeah. And the limited stuff is in the big bottles. So we have um, the three year rounds right now and we have uh, three of the big bottles, uh, uh, limited three limited editions out all the time. We're a bit like a brewery. We always have new stuff coming out, so mm -hmm. we always have something in the big bottle. There are some stores, for instance, co-ops, by and large, don't like our little bottle. They say, our consumers don't like little bottles, but you go in there and you see lots of little bottles on the shelf. But what they're saying is that, what they're actually saying is that our consumers prefer your big bottle because they can take them home and make kombucha out of them and whatever they make. So some stores really like to have, they only ever carry our limiteds and our seasonals, not because they only want limited or seasonals, but because they want the big bottle. That's something we didn't foresee, but we're happy to be able to give them stuff because we have, um, we have a product for them to be able to sell. Mm -hmm. So the product's also available in cakes. So some of the issues cakes. that happen with cakes with the cider. Yeah, so we have, um, we're able to pasteurize all of our bottles. We, we don't, we would, some of the cider that we make doesn't need to get pasteurized for stability, but we do pasteurize it to sleep well at night. Um, it doesn't take a lot of effort to, to pasteurize the bottles, and once it's capped and pasteurized, it's really locked down for, you know, until the dinosaurs come back. But a, a keg is a, a live product. Um, we do a light filtration on our cider, so there's still lots of yeast in there. And most of our ciders have a little bit of back sweetening added. Um, they're all mathematically dry. They all enter into the dry categories and competitions, but there is some residual sweetness. So the kegs are alive and they do referment. So the bottles, we can, we can store them outside. Um, we can store them anywhere. Um, we store them in our, in our dry storage warehouse room in the back. We keep our kegs in a cooler. Our distributor keeps them in their cooler. Um, accounts, you know, uh, retailers, they know that they have to keep them in a the cooler. So it's a lot more overhead in managing the kegs. Um, our bottles go all the way up to British Columbia and all the way down to Orange County, California, but our kegs only stay in Portland. And that's because we can control uh, how, uh, how fast they turn over. Um, and if there is an issue, occasionally a retailer comes to us and says, hey, I put this keg on and it's just foamy. So I'll say, no problem, I'll come right over with a, with a replacement keg. So the ability to be able to do that is really important to us, um, to be able to do that kind of hands-on thing until we have a way to stabilize kegs, and that involves microfiltration or adding chemicals to prevent fermentation, mm -hmm. neither of which we're really excited about. We, we will do those at, at some point, but we sell a lot of kegs locally anyway. Uh, and that really helps us out with, um, with our keeping our inventory levels low. Um, we, we have to keep our inventory of kegs low because we, have, we only have about a month of kegs on hand at any one time because um, we, like, we like to have it about a three-month keg, so we keep it about a month. I'd say about a month at the distributor, it's about a month at the retailer. That's kind of our thought, three months to, before it's empty. Um, uh, so we have that smaller, our smaller bright tank, our, it's called baby, little bright tank. 
um, we oftentimes will use that just to do a small run of kegs. So we use the big bright tanks for, for bottling and for canning, and the small bright tank oftentimes gets used only for kegs to fill in the gap in between big runs and kegs. And I mentioned cans. We do do some cans as well. We have a, a different line of ciders that we make that's kind of a, I call it the Tuesday night cider. And it's um, a 16-ounce can in a four-pack. The four-pack is $10 on the shelf. So that's 64 ounces for $10 versus um, 64 ounces for 10. Our big bottles are 25 ounces for 12. So it's, in, it's a really, really big cost savings for consumers. It's a much lower margin for us, but we don't do the canning. We have a mobile canning company that comes in. And they say, you know, where's the tank? There it is. And then they, I, I come back 15 hours later and it's emptied in cans, ready to go. We do pasteurize the cans after they've been filled, um, but it's a lot less work for us. Um, and it's, there's no ingredients that we add. We, we don't make paprika in there. We don't make any of our other ingredient heavy re uh, recipes in there. We just put only apple, fermented apple juice in there, and that's all. I think. Um... I'm not sure if I told you guys this, but you know, Square Mile, the cider product by Widmer, had a massive recall because of uh, blowing bottles. Yeah, they, they, they didn't they didn't blow up any bottles on the shelf, but they they had they, they figured out that they had some problems with their clay and yeah, and, and funny enough, the guy who makes that cider, the, uh, Craft Brewers Alliance doesn't actually make it; it's made by a contractor uh, in Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain in, in Eastern Oregon. You'll, you'll see that guy next, I think, in my production film. Okay. He, um, all the cider makers in the Northwest, we uh, we always joke, Andrew Brown is his name. We always say, Andrew, that your pasteurizer is not going to, doesn't work, man. It doesn't work. Um, the technology just doesn't really work. But he's been doing it successfully for like maybe 10 years or so until last month or a couple of months ago. So I think they're getting away from that that style of pasteurization. It was an inline pasteurization and not a in bottle pasteurization. Well, now they're adding a chemical. Even that's not 100. percent The gold standard in 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 stability is in bottle pasteurization, mm -hmm. and everything else is just a, is just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Any more questions out there? We've got a few more minutes. Thank you. Glad you like it. Uh, yes. we, have, we have a lot of ciders that we make, and I think we try to make one cider for every taste. You know? mm -hmm. Describe the effect of the aging process on flavor. Uh, so, um, this is, it's, it's really, it's pretty detailed the way it works. Um, when fermentation finishes, there's lots of, um, there are lots of flavor molecules that are short. This is, I'm, I'm going to summarize this quite a bit. The flavor molecules are short. Short flavor molecule is less interesting in your mouth. It's less complex. Uh, over time, these things recombine. They, they find each other again post-fermentation. These little molecules, they'll, they'll reconnect or they'll combine into longer molecules, which create more complexity in your mouth. That's not to say that complexity is always a, a, you know, a better taste. Some ciders taste really, really good fresh, and they don't really get better. They get different as time goes on. Um, so you, you know, we always keep an eye on that and we always try to figure out what kind of cider are we trying to make and thus how much aging do we want, do we need to have in there. We don't automatically assume that all aged cider is better. Uh, and that being said, sometimes aging too long can, um, can uh, affect the flavor you know, in a bad way, particularly if it's not stored very well. Um, if you have some yeast sediment bottom of the bottle, those yeast cells die, and it's what's called autolyzing or autolysis. And autolyzed yeast um, tastes really, really bad. So uh, it's about managing, you know, how much the aging process is going to be, and, and getting it out the door uh, at the right time. The another trick about aging process is uh, pasteurization. Um, does it, it has the uh, the Maillard process, which is caramelizing of sugars. Um, it also accelerates that recombining of flavors of, of molecules. So most cider makers that I talk to, we all agree that the best way to describe a pasteurized cider is aged. It fakes aging. So we can we can take a cider that's um, somewhat fresh and run it through our pasteurizer, and it doesn't boil at all. It's we bring it up to like 148 degrees Fahrenheit. That's it. We bring it up and right back down. So it's not very hot. Um, 
and it, it, it adds a lot of depth and it adds a lot of roundness. Not, it doesn't reduce the acidity or reduce it, any of the sharpness, but it adds roundness to the mouthfeel, which is really great. Um, we, we like that pasteurization, generally makes it taste better. Uh, next question, do you essentially just dry hop your styles and have hops in the recipe? Essentially, yeah. Um, our best seller hopper cock is, is just dry hop, just like a brewery would do it, post-fermentation in the bright tank. We put hops, pelletized hops, sometimes we put whole leaf hops, depending on what we're making, um, in the tank. We sit, let it sit there for three, four, five, ten days or whatever, and then we bottle it um, off, leaving the hops behind in the tank. Um, we're working on some other recipes that don't just dry hop. They actually call for uh, boiling juice, just like you were boiling wort. Um, and, you know, when you're boiling wort, you add um, hops at that point. Um, we're experimenting with all manner of hopping, um, not just dry hopping. We have, we have one recipe that we're working on right now that we're going to send it all through a, a hop randle, or like a, like a small hop back. So as it goes into the bottle, as it goes into the bottles, it gets uh, fresh um, fresh hops. Um, so we're constantly refilling that, that randle to be uh, full of fresh hops. So we're big into the hops. I love hops. I love beer. Um, and we're trying to push push what it means to use um, hops in, in cider, not just because we're trying to copy beer, but because we love the flavor of hops and we love cider. So there you go. Any more questions? We have a few more minutes. One, one more. Great. Will the timbers? Uh, yes, they will. Absolutely. When you boil the juice, how do you get the pectinase down? Um, we don't really have a problem. We don't ever use pectinase. Some cider books say, you know, use sulfites, use pectinase. We don't do any of that. Adjust with malic acid. We don't do any of that stuff. Um, we don't notice a problem with pectins. Uh, we don't boil the whole thing because we don't have a 120 barrel kettle. We have a 50 gallon stainless steel pot that sits on top of a turkey burner. So we fill that pot up like with like 30 or 40 gallons of juice and we boil that and then blend that back into the big batch. Um, so we don't really notice any problems with pectins. We don't ever use pectinase. We don't use any fining agents for clarifying. We do do a coarse filtration on pretty much everything, but then we add a lot of ingredients post-filtration. So a lot of our ciders are cloudy, but they're controlled cloudiness. Um, so I don't, we don't really notice any problem with the pectins. Um, I think because there's a lot of water, you know, if you boil juice forever, you'll make like apple jelly probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but you gotta boil it forever. We're boiling it, we're boiling ours for 60 minutes. And again, it's a portion of it. Um, maybe we'll get bitten by it later, but we haven't any problems yet. Good question. Okay, great. Well, that's, that's it for tonight, unless anybody has a pressing question. Um, as I mentioned next week, we are not having a live session since it's the uh, Thanksgiving week, and um, yeah, I don't think we'd have a lot of people show, tuning in on Wednesday night. So we'll take a break for a couple of weeks, and then we'll be back. Um, let's see, we'll have Alex from Upright. So we'll be talking about that before um, we have two last live sessions left after tonight. So enjoy your holidays, everybody. And thanks for joining us. And thanks. Thank you. Matt. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Right there.